So today we have the opportunity to um, come and take the precepts and chant and pay homage to the Buddha because today is the Lunar Observance Day, entirely they call one pra. And so we've all come to engage in these good activities. And we're very fortunate that the teachings of the Buddha still exist in the world and that we've also had the good fortune to take birth as a human and to meet with the Buddha Sasana, this Buddhist religion. And this is a great boon, a great uh, form of merit that we have to be able to do this. And if we think this through, well, what if the Buddha hadn't uh, become awakened, if he hadn't come into this world, then what would we be like? And what situation would that leave us in? We wouldn't then know this path of practice that lifts our hearts out of suffering and we'd just be stuck in the world, uh, just stuck in seeking pleasure out of forms, out of sounds um, and tastes and tactile sensations and thoughts and all of these pleasures that we gain in the world. And then when we gain these pleasure in the world, then <clears throat> our mind is just stuck there. And we um, carry on operating through the defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion. So when we're born into this world, then <clears throat> what we also gain from that birth is old age, sickness, and in the end, death. When we're born, most people get the feeling that they're not going to die and that they'll be around here forever. And so we try to study and um, gain as much knowledge as we can. We try to develop our skills so that we can get good work and earn a lot of money. And we do this in order to be able to receive gain and receive praise and status and happiness in the world. But with these four um, aspects of the world also comes their opposites. There's also uh, loss and uh, the degeneration of status, criticism and suffering as well. But we don't want these things. We just want the good aspects of the world, the things that we like. We just want the gain and the praise. And we just want the happiness. So the things that we find undesirable, we don't want to receive those. And just the good things, the things that we find enjoyable, then we want to get those. But it's not possible um, for this to happen that when we're born into the world, then we have to meet with all of these things. So most people, when they come into this world, they're not really sure of which path they should take, how they should live their lives. And that's because the amount of wisdom they have is insufficient. So there's a instance at the time of the Buddha when he was staying up on Vulture's Peak and for any of you who have been to India and been there, then you can um, imagine the situation. And uh, Sariputta, the Buddha's uh, foremost disciple in wisdom, his right-hand disciple, was sitting next to the Buddha, attending on him and fanning him. And then a Brahmin came along uh, called uh, Diganaka Brahmin. And he was he climbed up Vulture's Peak in order to find a place where no one had died before because he himself was reaching the end of his life and he wanted to die in a place that was pure where no one else had died. But the Buddha told him that you yourself have died here many, many times. And there's no place in the world, there's no bit of land that... that uh, 
has never seen the death of any person. It doesn't exist. Because huge numbers of people have been born into this world, there are many different beings and animals that come into this world, and so there's also a lot of death. And then all these beings cycle around and take birth and then die again. And so this Brahman was trying to find a place where he could die, where no one else had died before, but that place just didn't exist. The Buddha then asked him, what views do you hold? And in India at that time, it was uh, very common for Brahmins to be very intellectual and uh, will be kind of philosophers and think about life and develop um, many views, many different views about the nature of the world and the nature of life. And it's similar these days to Hinduism. Um, and mostly uh, Hindus these days uh, try to have the, the view that they shouldn't harm any beings or harm any animals. But at that time, the Buddha's time, there were many different sects and many teachers of those sects. And so there were huge numbers of views uh, going around India. So this Brahman held the view that the things that he found undesirable were inappropriate for him to receive. That the things he didn't want, then he shouldn't get those things. And all that he should get was the things that he liked and find desirable. The Buddha then responded that this view that you hold is inappropriate for you. And the Brahmin was confused by this. He thought that this view that he had was correct for sure. It just makes sense. Uh, if I don't want something, then I shouldn't get that thing. And this is a good view. This is a view that, that makes me happy. But the Buddha told him that it was incorrect, and the Brahmin was uh, confused by that. So the Buddha asked him, what about old age? Are you going to become old? Do you want that? And what about sickness? Do you want sickness? And death, is that desirable? So this Brahmin then contemplated into that and saw that old age, sickness and death these things are undesirable. So the Buddha asked him, well, when you get these things, when you receive them, what will that be like? So this Brahman then contemplated and thought, well, I do have to receive these things. I'm not going to be able to escape from old age, sickness and death. And when I do get them, then there's going to be a lot of suffering that comes up. So he contemplated this and to this nature of suffering, and found that the view he held was incorrect. That just not getting the things that he didn't want, that that was impossible. And that when he did get those things, there'd be a lot of suffering as a result. So he understood this through his uh, insight and his contemplation. Understood that when he gets the things that he doesn't want, then he's going to have to suffer because of that. And it's just not possible to only get desirable things from this world. So he could see then into the changing nature of conditions, condition phenomena, see that they're a source of stress and that we can't control them or order them about. That eventually all sankharas need to, uh, break up and pass away. We attach to these things as being me and mine, but really we're not able to control them. And this Brahman understood this clearly. He gained great faith in the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings and asked to take refuge in the Triple Gem, in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And then he praised the Buddha as being someone who uh, upturned something that was overturned and someone who shows clearly the path. He saw that when there are conditions for something to arise, then that thing will arise. 
So just like us coming to be born into this world and the realm of existence that we've taken birth in, we can call it the uh, karma bhava, the uh, existence or the realm of sensuality. Because it's the realm that beings are enticed by forms and sounds and tastes, uh, sensations and thoughts. That's the nature of this level of existence. So all of these different things, these uh, sense impressions that we experience from the world, then that um, pulls us in. And we become enticed by that and we uh, seek pleasure out of these things, out of forms, out of tastes, out of sounds. And because we seek pleasure in these things, that's what lead us, leads us on to birth in this realm, to, uh, for our consciousness to come into the womb. And so this uh, gamma bhava, this realm of sensuality, it has different levels to it. At the moment, we're in the human level, but there's also the heaven level above us. And it's also possible to go down as well into the animal worlds and the hell realms. So this is the, the middle level that we're in. And if uh, we go up from here, then we get into the Deva realms and the Brahma worlds. And then down from here is the uh, Abhayapum, the uh, realms of deprivation. So there's the hell world, and there's the realm of the uh, Asula guys, the, uh, the cowardly titans. And then there's also the animal world. But when we build merit and that goodness that we've created sends its results, then we're able to come to a good birth. So like us, uh, taking up the precepts, whether it's the five precepts or the eight precepts, when this fruits and uh, bears its results, then we'll be able to, um, that will fruit uh, in our hearts and our hearts will become good and beautiful. This will then take us to a human birth. But in this human world, we don't only experience happiness. A birth in a human form comes with both happiness and suffering. So there's the pleasant side of sensuality that we experience, but there's also the unpleasant side, the uh, negative consequences, and both of these uh, come together as a pair. So this human world, it's, it's in the middle of all of it, in the middle of... Uh, the Buddhist cosmology. And we can liken it to taking rest under a tree, and a tree that has very thick leaves and, uh, and uh, has a very abundant foliage. And so even though that tree provides us shade and it provides us uh, shelter to some degree from rain and from the sun, but if we want for us to never experience heat or to never get wet, that's not possible. It only provides so much shelter for us. So having been born into this world, we should try to develop our spiritual perfections as much as possible. If we don't develop much wisdom and we become deluded by the world, if we don't keep our moral precepts well, then the energy of our heart will dissipate and our minds will drop to a subhuman level. When our bodies undergo death, then we'll take birth into a form that exists below the human world. And it's very difficult in these realms there's a lot of competing, um, a lot of scrambling for 
resources, just trying to find food is very difficult. And we can see this with the, the cats and the dogs around us, that they're experiencing the results of the karma that they've produced in the past. And if they are to receive a, an easy life or a life without that much suffering, that comes from the kindness that humans give them. And there's a lot of danger in this world. They always have to be on guard because there are many different things that want to take their lives. And if we go even lower than the animal world, then there's a huge amount of suffering and pain that uh, exists in those places. So becoming is something which happens in the mind. And this becoming then causes us to take birth. Whether we take birth in the realm of uh, sensuality, or whether it's in the form realm or the formless realm, whenever we have desire, that will then lead us on to birth. So having taken birth in this realm, we should do our best to develop the Brahma Viharas, to build up our kindness, our compassion, our um, empathetic joy, and the equanimity that we have. We develop the wish for all beings to be happy, to experience lightness and ease, because we see that we're all together, we're all in the same boat. All of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we've been born as, we have to get old, we have to experience sickness, and we have to die. So contemplating and thinking in this way naturally brings up feelings of kindness in our hearts. We can see that other people and ourselves are really no different. It's difficult to separate um, me and other out. We contemplate that we're just a collection of elements and we depend upon the earth elements and the water, the air, the fire to be able to live. And when these things run out and separate out, then that's our death. So our bodies and the bodies of others are just the same. There's no difference between them. So we want for beings both ourselves and others, to uh, find the way out of suffering and to be happy. And this is us developing this quality of metta in our hearts. We also wish to free other beings from suffering. Whenever we see beings in pain, we want for them to be relieved from that pain that they're experiencing. So we carry on developing this quality of metta, developing all of the Brahma Viharas. We can see that the Buddha was someone who had limitless metta. You can't find a boundary to it. It just went on without end. That he spent so much time, these four asankayas and 100,000 kalpas, developing his spiritual perfection so that he was able to take beings out of suffering, to point them the way out of samsara. So the amount of uh, kindness and compassion that he had was great, and we can't find uh, anything to compare it with. That he came to teach us this path that leads out of suffering. And this is one of the, the great virtues of the Buddha. And so... We phrase this as Apamano Buddha, that the Buddha is limitless, endless. The compassion that he had to help beings who were engulfed in suffering, to wish for them to be freed from that. And for us as well, when we see beings going through pain, then we develop that wish to want to help them, for them to be freed from that suffering. If we see that there are floods, there are fires, earthquakes, any disasters, then we wish for the beings to be freed from those. And always to have compassion there as a basis for our hearts. So the compassion of the Buddha was vast. 
that he spent so much time finding this path out of suffering and went through great difficulty to teach that path as well. And for us, we've all received um, and are currently receiving the compassion of the Buddha as well. Just the fact that we're able to engage in this path of practice and we know about the moral precepts, this all comes from the compassion of the Buddha. Another of the Buddha's great qualities was his purity. That um, he practiced until he had uh, found uh, freedom from suffering, was able to purify his heart from the kilesas. So for us coming into this world, we experience both happiness and suffering from the world. And it's the same for all beings. So when we see um, other people gaining good things, when they um, gain wealth, when they increase their status, when they gain happiness from the world, then we can also feel joy for them as well. And this is the quality of mudita. So beings born into this world, we can feel happy for that as well, that they've had the good fortune and they've created the enormous amount of merit that it takes to gain a human birth. And they've also been born into a body that's complete, that's not lacking in any way. And that's a great amount of merit for them to be able to gain that. And this merit is showing its results in this way. Having taken a human birth, then they have the opportunity to keep the precepts and hear the Dhamma. So we have happiness that, that uh, the people that have been born as humans have the opportunity to do this. So whenever people meet with good things, whenever we see that someone has gained wealth, that they've gained status, that they gain praise or they're happy, then we have happiness with them as well. We feel joyful at that too. And this developing of mudita helps to relieve our hearts from feelings of jealousy. So as we develop these Brahma Viharas, that makes the keeping of the precepts an easy thing to do. Because these precepts depend on our kindness and compassion. But having been born into the world, it's natural that all of us have some level of greed, hatred, and delusion there in our hearts. If they're just to one certain degree, then we'll be born as humans. But if there's a huge amount of greed, hatred, and delusion, then we'll fall down into a subhuman level. If these kilesas, the defilements, are weak, then the mind will get born uh, in the Brahma worlds. And it may get born in the uh, Rupa Brahma world. Um, which is a plane of much happiness. And beings there uh, find joy in practicing, in developing meditation, and attaining levels of samadhi, and abiding in those, uh, those levels of uh, absorption. But no matter what level uh, beings are born in, whether it's the form the Brahmas of the worlds of form or formless Brahmas, uh, still, once having taken that birth, there will at some point be death. So all beings born into every level of existence are still stuck in the cycle of sangsara, of becoming and then birth, of experiencing the results of our karma. So for us, the question is, having been born into this human world, what should we do with that birth? What should we do with the rest of our lives? Because having taken birth, then we need to meet with old age, sickness and death. That these things come together, they come as a pair. When there is birth, then at the same time, there's also the arising of old age, sickness and death. So what should we do? We can liken it to, like if we have a good level of morality 
and we are beings of integrity, then it's like being born on the surface of the world. And we all know that if you go down deep into the earth, uh, below the surface, then it's very hot under there. So having this sila dhamma, having a decent standard of morality, we've taken birth on the surface of the world. But if we have a lot of attachments that cause us to break sila, then that's like sinking down into the, into the earth. And it's very hot under there. So the Buddha gained purity in his heart, and he was able to see the way that leads um, to that purity and to teach us that path as well. And a very important aspect of that is sila, is morality. And the very least, keeping the five precepts. Having generosity, having sila, and also practicing meditation at some times. Because for people who are engaged in the world, who live a lay life, then they have to work as well, have to maintain their lives. And so it's, it's not possible to sit in meditation all the time. But we should understand that bhavana, this practice of cultivating the mind, of lifting up the level of the mind, it's something that is an activity of our hearts. It's an inner work. So whenever we have mindfulness, then we are practicing at that point. And it's not the case that only sitting in meditation or listening to the Dhamma is bhavana. Or we only can practice when we're at the monastery. We can do it all the time. So when you leave the monastery, then try to take your mindfulness with you as well. Some people would say to Ajahn Chah that they just didn't have the time to practice. And Ajahn Chah would ask them in return, do you have time to breathe? Because if we have time to breathe, then we can practice. So the dates and nights are relentlessly passing. They're passing by, passing by. So what are we doing right now? And the time that we have left in this world, what are we going to do with that? We should use this opportunity that we have to contemplate a lot in a manner that allows us to let go. Having been born, then we need to meet with old age, sickness and death. We need to meet with degeneration and decay. We can see that these things are unstable. Life is not sure, but death is sure. Life is uncertain, but what's certain is that the end of our lives is death. So we contemplate like this, and investigate into this nature, seeing that with birth comes old age, sickness and death. And when we see this, then we understand that what's really important is to try to develop as much goodness as we can with our time left in this world. <laughs> 